Uh, this is Gail Morgan yeah. welcoming yeah. you to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Now, your host, James Just. Thank you all for joining us. We want to welcome John and Richard back today. It's been an interesting week in the news. Um, Gavin Newsom and the legislature are trying to change the rules right in the middle of the game again. It's <laughs> we've So, on top of that, we've also got Gavin Newsom getting caught... Let's so we say misrepresenting how much work in the wildfires he's been doing. We've got so you've got these two kind of bizarre issues going on here in California this week. We've got one, we've got Gavin Newsom, who has essentially lied because his unions tried to back him up and saying, "Oh, it's a miscommunication." I'm sorry, you can't miscommunicate by that much. You know? Yeah, John's got a lot to say about that, so I'm going to make my comment very uh, short, to the point, and terse. Uh, Gavin politician or Gavin Newsom is a politician. His mouth was open. <laughs> I'm. Go I'm, ahead, John. I'm. I'm actually shocked because because Richard was terse and and to the point. Usually it takes him three four hundred more words than that. But uh, no. Um, yeah, Gavin lied lies about lots of stuff. But the fire issue. Uh, I don't have the numbers. I I should have looked them up before the show. Um, Gavin uh, managed to get a whole bunch of money to fight fires uh, in um, in the state of California, and um, the idea was that that uh, they were going to implement programs to prevent forest fires. And so, uh, what they actually did was hired a bunch of firefighting uh, people who are all union employees who make great wages, who give him lots of money to get reelected, whereas. Fire prevention would have been uh, clearing forests uh, and uh, you know education. You know, basically helping helping. John, let me give you help with the, yeah. with the numbers here for a second. Yeah. He overstated it by six hundred and ninety percent. He claimed yeah. nine hundred ninety thousand acres had been cleared and treated, but the the actual what the actual numbers were eleven thousand. Ad pops up eleven thousand three hundred and ninety. Yeah, well, so that's it's not just, like he just rounded up. <laughs> that's just the most. That's just the most recent number. But he got literally billions of dollars, and instead of spending it on on fire prevention, which fire prevention doesn't need to be done by uh, union laborers who retire after twenty years of quote unquote work, uh, making a hundred thousand dollars a year plus, uh, fire prevention can be done by all these out of work uh, uh, loggers we have, because you know the idea of that is not. I mean, controlled burns are one thing, and you probably should have somebody monitoring a controlled burn. But what people in private industry do to prevent uh, fires is they make sure that forests aren't overgrown and and, uh, underbrush is cleared and there's not a lot of fuel on the ground. So uh, what Gavin has done is is hired a whole bunch of people to – he's done a little bit of controlled burns, and controlled burns are just one part of fire prevention, and hired a whole bunch of people to fight the fires – that are going to happen because they didn't do what they should have done. And, um, you know, there's, there's probably, what is there? 140 million dead trees after this next round of dry summer, there's probably gonna be 150 million dead trees in forests in California. And, and if you want to prevent fires, you don't have a bunch of firefighters waiting to put out the fire after it starts. Cause all of that fuel there is remove those things. And, and, those loggers be, I'm willing to bet a lot of them would work at break even uh, to do that because they, they, you know, make their living from the woods because they love the woods, just like farmers make their living from the land because they love the land. And, uh, you know, watching this mismanagement and the lies associated, associated with this mismanagement is, uh, is, is pretty disgusting. And I think that's really all I got to say. Yeah, it's not just a little exaggeration where you kind of round up and mm. that type of thing, which is kind of normal. You know, a little bit of hyperbole. It's six hundred ninety percent. It's ninety thousand yeah. versus eleven thousand. And that ninety thousand yeah, have, have ninety thousand should have thousand. been a million. That, that at at this point, with all that money, there should be a million acres that have been taken care of either through thinning of forests. Uh, or control burns, and so it's it's even worse. Go ahead, Richard. And, and, you know, the outset is there will be a, a difficult fire season this year, almost for sure. And Gaffin Newsom predictably wants to move the election up before the fire season begins. I wonder why that might be. 
and before the fire season and before the rolling blackouts that they pretty much guaranteed to happen because well, <laughs> you know it's nothing nothing like uh, uh, you know having your air conditioning go out because you can't run it if you have any power at all you're going to keep your your very expensive food because of government caused inflation from from defrosting in your freezer and then you know if you got a backyard to move into you're going to move into your backyard because you can't stay cool in your house but then you're going to be choking on the smoke from the fires burning. So there's going to be an awful lot of upset voters, and hopefully enough of them will be upset enough to uh, get rid of this clown. And we're going to think one of the topics is uh, the failure of lockdowns. So Yeah, that one's know, coming that, up next. I just want yeah. to say one more thing about this, yeah. this changing of the rules. This is the second time in four years they've changed the rules to help one of their Democrat Party members. This is the second time they're trying to do it, and which is – Part of the problem is that, you know, we can chop the head off, we can chop off Newsom, but the dragon still exists. The mm -hmm. legislature and the Senate and all the stuff that actually operates the, the state government still exists. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's it's a good symbolic move, and I'm happy to vote against Newsom and get him out of there because he's a lying politician. <laughs> I'll use a different slur. Oxy, oxymoron, lying <laughs> yeah. politician. Yeah. Man. But uh, it just, uh, I'm wondering exactly how much good it's going to do in the long term. Anyway, mm -hmm. and as okay. we discussed in a new paper, economics, economists, sorry, from the University of Southern California and the Rand Corporation examined the effectiveness of the pandemic lockdowns using data from the United States and 43 other countries. And they found out that it's actually had a negative impact on death rates, not a positive impact. And essentially they've been useless. At best, they're worse, useless. worse than useless. And, yeah. and yeah, we, we, we were we were saying that a year ago uh, or more than a year ago. We were saying that the increase in suicides, the increase in uh, drug abuse, the increase in alcoholism, the increase in uh, you know cry, uh, uh, deaths due to not being able to get admitted to the hospital for uh, cancer screenings and and uh, other uh, preventive medical uh, procedures, all of those would increase the death rate more than any perceived change in the coronavirus uh, mm. death rate being lowered. And, mm. and there's a lot of evidence that shows that there, there was not even a lowering in the coronavirus uh, COVID death rate. So the whole thing is something that we predicted. And it's interesting. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a situation where we gave to government willingly, for the most part, not you and I, the three of us, but most people Unwell. gave to government gave to government the collective responsibility for fighting this deadly quote unquote virus. We, we, we gave up our own personal responsibility for not getting the virus, which would include uh, quarantining if we were in the at-risk group with comorbidities or too old or whatever. It included the responsibility for making sure that we wore masks or socially distanced when we thought it was appropriate, not 100% of the time, no matter where you are. And uh, it, we gave up the ability to decide whether we were safer inside versus outside. And it's almost uh, a foregone conclusion that we're safer outside where the virus is, will blow away than, than inside where it won't. Uh, and we gave up all that stuff to the collective responsibility of government. Individual responsibility equates with liberty, Collective responsibility co correlates with tyranny. That's the bottom line. That's what we need to remember. Yeah, absolutely agree. And one of the things that was mentioned in passing in the article, which I think is the most despicable outcome, is that, you know, the, the liberals claim to uh, care and those who are favor of big government claim to care about other people, which is why they insist upon uh, um, taking money from, from people who created it and giving it to other people to make them better off. But the people that were hurt worst in the world, and, and some in the United States, but most in third world countries, are children and who were pushed into the lowest level of poverty. We didn't even, you didn't even mention, Richard, uh, one of the other outcomes is the, the hole in the earning ability of, of students who've lost a year and a half and will never make that up because the schools weren't open because they are government schools, don't want to call them public schools. And so that's been horrible. But the real crying shame to, to, about this whole mess to me is that poor people throughout the world, because of the, the economic crunch, 
uh, over 100 million of them, at last count, it's probably 200 million now, were pushed into the lowest form of poverty. Many of those are children, and many of them will flat out die. Way more of them will die than people uh, died from the coronavirus. And um, that's the big shame, and that's not, I, I still don't think that's talked about uh, by enough people loudly enough. Uh, these people who supposedly care about others obviously didn't care about the most vulnerable people on the planet. And that's what really makes me upset. I don't know if anybody's done it yet, but I would guess that if somebody ran a correlation between governments that are autocratic, tyrannical, and government shutdowns, there would be a very, very steep co positive correlation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think absolutely. We, we didn't have the one thing that, you know, we're supposed to be in fact famous for is balance. We're supposed to balance the needs of, you know, basic human rights versus public health versus the fact that, you know, we know we're going to be wrong. Mm. When we have these put all our eggs in one basket and you're just increasing the likelihood that we're going to be wrong and the consequences of that. I know someone who had a motorcycle accident and didn't go to the hospital because they were afraid of catching, cor catching coronavirus. They'd rather get an infection from the road rash and all the various other stuff than go to the hospital and get treated because they were afraid of coronavirus. They had we installed that much fear in people that they were willing to not get treated for a serious incident because uh, out of fear of something else. It, it's mind boggling that we actually deliberately did this. Yeah. And, and, and then, how many people are going to actually get away with it? Well, and the other thing that they not the article itself, but one of the comments that that we pat we passed for for our. our Thousands of people who watch this show on a regular basis. We pass articles around to do research before we talk about this stuff. Is that um, if if you any logical person would would look at this situation and ask themselves the question: Why did governments do this? Why did these people take a hundred years of pretty good public health knowledge and throw it out the window over this virus? And the only rational conclusion you can come to is that it was a power grab. It was a power grab to uh, to uh, that happened at, at some especially precarious timing prior to a major election in this country, uh, and I'm not saying that was the reason, but that was certainly one of the outcomes. That the outcome of that election. Well, I'll, I'll go there. I'll say that was the reason. Okay. All right. And then I'll I'll yeah. See, I don't. I'm not a big believer in in conspiracies because you know these people can't. It's, it's not letting a good crisis to, go to waste. Yeah. yeah, don't well, is so that I'm Ron Emanuel? Didn't he say that? Yeah. yeah. And so this 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 crisis uh, then allowed uh, people who wouldn't have been in power without the crisis to uh, ram through uh, a bunch of uh, easy spending socialist slash liberal stuff, re-regulate the world, uh, hand out money to their friends. Uh, you know the governments. Uh, Cause the economic fallout because of these lockdowns and closing businesses, and then the the uh, states that were most affected were the ones that were most locked down, and they were also amazingly the ones that voted the most for this power change. Without New York and California, the other party would be in power, maybe not not any better off. But I think the the the, uh, the handling of this whole situation would be better, and so. Uh, that bailout mostly helps out those those political entities that supported this change in power. And so I absolutely agree with Richard that uh, this isn't being talked about, but certainly the reason. Because um, if you'd have followed public health science, there's less of this stuff would have happened. And uh, they protected the most vulnerable people uh, like they did in the past. And, uh, and then herd immunity would have you know, would have gone through and they made it very hard to develop vaccines so that, you know, the lockdowns that they implemented lasted even longer than they should have. Um, so on still, going and on. On. still going on in some places. Yeah. yeah, yeah well, and then I'm Germany's not willing to rule out. Down. Yeah. I'm not willing to rule out panic and incompetence and then the grifters come in. Yeah. And Australia, I just read this morning, Australia is now locking down their cities because of course they don't have any herd immunity because they've been locking down it, it's mm. you have to let the dang thing spread in order to get past it it's kind of the bizarre consequence of the whole thing it's either yeah either everybody needs to get vaccinated and uh or or enough people need to catch of natural uh, immunity afterwards and all the tests that are being done uh now indicate that once you have caught 
uh, even a mild version of the flu bit or the COVID, whatever you want to call it. One of the publications I read calls it the CCP virus, Chinese Communist Chinese Party virus. Um, and that might that 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 would be certainly be a wonderful opportunity for a rant in the future. There, uh, you know, the people who caused this are blaming everybody else, and uh, you know what com comes around goes around. Everybody was talking about the the the, the lab thing being a fantasy, and da da da. Now, ah, surprisingly, it's coming out of the lab. But you know, we 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 did that. We do this to ourselves by by letting uh, these people take and hold power. And and the only way to not have this kind of a uh, horror happen again is to remove power from these people because they're going to take it and hold it. And some programs that they've implemented during this this grab are going to last for years. They'll be on the books for years. And and what did Newsom say? Your favorite person, James, said uh, that he's he's uh, not going to eliminate the the uh, state of emergency in California until the virus is eradicated. And the virus is never going to be eradicated. Yeah, it does Therefore, affect. we're always going to live under a state of emergency. Which yeah. is kind of a defeats the purpose. A state of emergency is a short-term issue, not long-term yeah. how life is. Once if, yeah. if it becomes part of normal life, it's part of normal life, and you deal with it through the normal political mm -hmm. process, not through states of emergency. But you talked about going to court. We're going to go ahead and move on. The Supreme Court has struck a, a big uh, – this is a big blow here, but I think it's a big win for property rights, actually. Against the union's invasion, about you call it a union invasion. Against unions essentially coming onto a private business, interrupting their operations so they can give a sales pitch. It, you know, that's never made any sense to me. Unions are just businesses. <laughs> they, they sell a service to employees. And since when can you just any business have the government say, yeah, you have to let this guy come on and give you a sales pitch for three hours every two weeks or whatever it is? It's kind of it's an every absurd day. concept. Three hours a day access. State of California law, but the Supreme Court said it was unconstitutional, which is a wonderful thing. And I think Richard probably has something to say about it, I'm guessing. Yeah, I'm just, I would say that this is a good thing, uh, and, and it's uh, the result of some uh, diligent lawyers at the uh, Pacific Legal Foundation working for many, uh, many years. This case has been mm -hmm. uh, working its way through the uh, lower courts and the appellate courts for uh, at least five or six years now. I think Probably it started more. in the, the, the initial activity that got the ball rolling was in 2015. Okay, so six years. Long, yeah, six years it took to get it to the Supreme get Court. Get it to the Supreme course. Court. And, and, yeah. uh, and, you know, it's just very, very fundamental. If you have the right to own property, and theoretically we have property owning rights in the United States, then you have the right to exclude whoever you want from your property. It's your yeah. property. You want to exclude somebody? You can. It doesn't make any difference whether they're wearing a, a, a union uh, label or not. Mm. Yeah, and this this kind of dovetails into another case. There was a uh, I'm trying, Janus decision a while back uh, that curtailed uh, union power pretty significantly. People uh, um, were supposed to have the right to opt out of paying union dues. And the state of California, of, of course, the day the Supreme Court decision came down, uh, ran through a piece of legislation they had sitting on the desk that gave uh, all, the unions all sorts of uh, uh, nefarious ways to keep people from um, opting out of paying uh, dues to unions that don't have their best interests at heart, uh, unions that... that choose to support oppressive government and, and one to, to, I think it's like 93 or 94% of union support goes to uh, Democratic or even further left candidates uh, because they all believe in, in unions and, and they love that union money. And uh, another example of, of union overreach being supported by the government. Uh, and, and still, uh, they actually, the state of California law uh, states that, that the, the employer uh, can't tell a, a uh, public employee who is a member of a union about their rights that that information has to come from the union. So it's, it's a crazy pro-union world we live in, and despite all of that, uh, union membership is shrinking by, uh, by, by huge numbers every year. As in the private sector, but not in the public sector. What a surprise. Yeah. Well, it doesn't well, surprise me. Yeah. That, and that Fra yeah. Franklin, Franklin Delano Roosevelt flat out said that, that uh, uh, there shouldn't be any 
uh, public employee unions, but because he understood the consolidation of power that would take place from that. And, and you know, basically he was a socialist. So what the heck? I don't think they had public employee unions in Nazi Germany. I'm not sure. Mm. Anyway. Well, the, the modern mm. union doesn't actually represent the individuals. And we learned this during the, the gig worker fight, AB5 and Prop 22, mm. is the unions never came to the gig workers and asked, what are your problems and how can we help you? It's just, here, we say you have these problems and here's your solution. And they never, anytime we said, well, that's not what we want, here's what we want, they say, ah, those are just corporate talking points. Mm. Well, they're corporate talking points because we've told them that's what we want. Mm. And, you know, these things, this isn't a either or issue. We know that we wanted, you know, freedom and flexibility instead of, you know, extra benefits. Because for us, benefits are changed. For gig workers, benefits are changed. We don't want to be tied that closely to the people who give us cash. Mm-hmm. We want to have a quick and easy economic exchange. You, I, I perform tasks. You give me cash. And that's it. It's the only connection we want. And, you know, they've taken that away from us in, in many respects. Yeah. So, so in another one here, the George has ordered the FBI to halt the forfeiture of cash and jewelry from a safety deposit box. There is an issue, I think, in Southern California where, yeah. where the um, FBI – had a search warrant and the search warrant expressly said you can't search the safety deposit boxes and they took them and searched them anyway. You can't seize the the, the seize stuff in, in the uh, safety deposit boxes and and they certainly did that. And I think there was a limited search. I'm going to correct me if I'm wrong, Richard and James, because I I probably am. The, the, the search warrant was extremely limited. Uh-huh. And the... Uh, and and as you said, James, spelled out specifically that uh, the the assets couldn't be seized under forfeiture rules. Uh, I think it's interesting. A specific thing. Yeah. The interesting thing about this case is this was a, a private safety deposit box company. If you uh, have a safety deposit box at a bank, the government can come in without any pretext whatsoever and take whatever you know. Open the open the. Uh, safety deposit box and do whatever they will, will with it. That was proven uh, really, really strongly during the uh, FDR administration when people were legally able to own gold, gold bullion, and stored it in safety deposit boxes. Roosevelt, by executive order, made that illegal. And within weeks or, or months, everybody had to uh, have their safety deposit box open with a federal agent in attendance to uh, make sure that there was in, that any gold that was in the safety deposit box was confiscated, and I think it was twenty-three dollars an ounce. Shortly after that, Roosevelt raised the price to thirty-five dollars an ounce, thereby confiscating a huge uh, a huge part of the wealth of ordinary Americans that that trusted actually were silly enough to trust banks and trust their government. The uh, Los Angeles uh, safety deposit box uh, system was not owned by a bank, which uh, theoretically gave it an added layer of protection. But the FBI ignored those layers of protection and uh, seized all of the assets anyway. Now a judge has ruled that not to be kosher. We'll see how far that goes on appeal. So my question with all this is how come how come we can have these agents of the government routinely violate laws, constitutions, have judges you know, issue orders that, yeah, he's violated laws and constitutions, and yet none of these uh, constitutional rights, and yet they're never held actually accountable. Well, it's because the the pretext for taking all of these uh, assets, uh, stealing money from the people, whether it's asset for, uh, you know, uh, civil asset forfeiture or just taking and uh, cleaning out safe deposit box, the, the pretext is that this money was Ill, is ill-gotten gains. It's uh, drug money, uh, i.e. money that was... Uh, legitimately earned by people selling drugs to people that wanted to buy drugs. But of course, that's not legal under our silly drug laws. So they have the pretext that they're trying to stop drug abuse by uh, stealing the, pro- the proceeds there from. And the same way with any other kind of uh, money laundering argument. What they're doing is they're saying that money which is earned by free exchange between free people is not legitimate if the government says it's not legitimate. And if it happens anyway, we're going to take the proceeds. And the bad thing, the especially bad thing about this situation is that the the uh, the FBI didn't uh, the way they wrote their argument. It was so specious that the judge says that this isn't even that what they wanted to do 
was basically they they ran a laundry list of all, money laundering, drug exchange, foreign currency violation, da, da da da, and said all these people are guilty of that. And the judge basically said, um, "No, you, you want a warrant for a specific crime. You have to spell out for each incident uh, which." crime, which specific crime these people might be guilty of to execute the search warrant. You can't just say they could be listed, they could be or are guilty of every crime from A to Z and then uh, not e take all their stuff and not prove it and keep it. And that's what the government does over and over again. And they take cash off of people on, on the bus, you know, who are using it to drive somewhere to buy a car and then bargain with you to give you back part of it. It's just crazy. And until... Uh, asset forfeiture is eliminated and, and qualified immunity is, is tweaked or eliminated, this stuff's going to go on. It just yeah, it's, it's nothing more than the sheriff of Nottingham, uh, you know, extorting and, and ripping off the peasants. It's, mm -hmm. it's uh, it, there, no change, you know, mm -hmm. about a thousand years, it's still, still the same old racket. Yeah, well, I think if they're going to act like uh, the stooges of the sheriff of Nottingham, they should at least wear tights. <laughs> I think they should be required to wear tights if you're going to be a... Uh, you know, if you're going to be one of Sheriff of Nottingham's evil men, at least walk around looking like the fool that you would be con convicted of being if our courts looked at thieves that work for the government as the same as they look for thieves of any other uh, sort. If I were to walk into a bank and say, uh, you know, this person who's a director of corporate corporation XYZ uh, sold me uh, a car that was a lemon and take a crowbar to the to the box and take the money out, I'd be in prison and, you know, for trying to get even. And these people aren't even doing that. They're basically just seizing stuff. Yeah, the know? assertion that simply because they're using a private, a private um, safety deposit service, safety deposit service makes them a guilty criminal. That's yeah, and this is something that the, that the Congress could very easily and in one fell swoop uh, cure by making all victimless crimes not crimes anymore and by uh, ending unequivocally uh, civil asset forfeiture, whether it's your safety deposit box or whether your, uh, your car is cleaned out on, on a traffic stop. I would personally like to see agents of the government start being held accountable when they violate constitutional and human rights. Yeah. One way or another. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly that, 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 would, is. that would be that would add a little bit of oomph to it, uh, and there, there's a, a word for that too, the name of which is escaping. <laughs> and we well, talk about escaping. We are out of time. Thank you for joining us this week, me and Richard and Team Counterpoint here. Want to make you all have, hope you all are doing well. Please remember to love everybody and have a good evening. Have a good one. Thank you very much for having me on the show, James. I really appreciate it. Thank you for watching The Libertarian Counterpoint. Listen each week in Sacramento on Comcast Channel 17 for Knuckleheads of Liberty on Monday at 5.30 p.m. and The Libertarian Counterpoint Show on Thursday at 8 p.m. Also on YouTube, Facebook, and podcasts everywhere. Please visit us at http colon slash slash www.libertariancounterpoint.com. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint Shows.